Well, I want to welcome Dr. Crystal Lewis to the show. She is a psychologist and researcher in the Intramural Research Program with specific expertise uh, in helping kids with stress and anxiety. I've got Amy McCarthy here with us today, and also Aaron Wick, who is the Senior Director of Behavioral Health and Student Support. And also, I want to welcome Daniel Logan to the show. Daniel is a New Zealand-born American actor. Uh, he is best known for his portrayal of Boba Fett, which is lovingly placed behind you, uh, hard to miss. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today to talk. You know, we've been talking a lot uh, in different episodes about bullying and about you know, how oftentimes that can lead to um, depression, to substance abuse, things like that. Um, I, I would love to hear from you, Dr. Lewis, what are some great ways, uh, you know, that parents can help to de-stress our kids? And maybe even starting a little bit before that, which is, you know, differentiating the, the signs and symptoms between, uh, you know, anxiety and, and stress. Like, is it an anxiety disorder or is it just sort of momentary stress? I think sometimes parents might have a little trouble differentiating the two. Thanks so much, Joey. I'm excited to be here to talk about this. Um, and I think, you know, you're exactly right. It's important to differentiate between stress and anxiety. And although they can manifest very similarly, they are different. And so essentially what we say is that um, stress is a response to an external thing. And so for teenagers, it might be um, starting at a new school, uh, a big test that they have upcoming. It could be something exciting like a graduation. Stress can be positive or negative. We say anxiety is more of the internal experience, the response to that external stressor. So the anxiety is often um, either a physiological response or a worry. I like to say it's just a worry about an unrealized future, something that has not happened yet, right? And so there can be a lot of angst or work up around things that haven't quite occurred. And so it's important when we're talking to our teens to, to help them understand that these are all normal experiences. Everybody has stress. Everyone has anxiety. But for parents, what we look at are these um, signs or these symptoms, which we can talk more about, but which seem to be persistent and ongoing that are more interfering for their children on a daily basis. Well, one of the things that, that you know, we, we've been talking about is like building that relationship and building that bond. And, you know, for my daughter who was just going through, like you were talking about, a really stressful situation of applying to high school and going through the HSPT test and, you know, a new environment and all of these sorts of things and grades, um, you know, I, I she just kind of bubbled over one day and, and, and started crying and got really upset and was like, I'm just really stressed and I don't know if this is going to happen and what if I don't get in and what if this doesn't happen? And I was able to talk her through it a little bit and able to be a sounding board for her. And I just was really proud in that moment because I knew, oh, I think I've put in some work to, to, to get us to this point where she trusts me enough to open up and say, I'm, I'm really stressed and I'm really hurting. One of the things that I have found is really helpful with my kids with de-stressing and also dealing with anxiety because um, I, I suffer from uh, an anxiety disorder myself. So I get it. It's not easy to deal with. Your head is running all the time. Uh, one of the things that I have incorporated since my girls were little was meditation time. And particularly with my younger daughter, she loves to listen to a meditation as we fall asleep. And I'll still sometimes, you know, go and crash on the beanbag in her room and we'll meditate together. Um, Dr. Lewis, I know one of the things that you do is also some, some maybe online meditation sessions and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how that might be helpful for kids and even parents to de-stress and regulate themselves a little bit? Certainly. Um, yeah, meditation is a great way to just disrupt that anxiety cycle that can occur. Um, and so I often talk to my patients, my teenagers and tweens about using some of these practices. Um, there are some guided visualizations. And so I'll teach kids how to think of a really pleasant place, some, some place that they enjoy going to and sit and do some breathing and visualize this place. Um, it's important that we incorporate kind of five senses, so what they're seeing, what they're smelling, tasting, touching, and make it really vivid. And so we'll practice this in session. And I think it's great, that's a great, like you mentioned, you'll do with, with your daughter for families to do together. Um, and especially having these activities before bedtime, just calming the household down or, or at a stressful transition. So after school, before we get to our other activities, I'll talk with parents about how to integrate that into their kind of daily, you know, into their daily schedule. So using meditation, using guided visualizations, doing some breathing, yoga, all of these are great practices to help calm the body down to manage stress and anxiety. 
I think what's great about meditation too and mindfulness is like there's science that backs up like this is not fluff like th there are health outcomes that are you know like just it is illustrated as demonstrated that you know by doing these things like you're going to live a healthier kind of life overall um, and I think not everyone kind of has heard about that or knows about that yet. So Daniel you know I know you I know you have a five-year-old son uh, and you know even five-year-olds get stressed. Five-year-olds have things that are on their mind that they're worried about. You know, do you find that your son uh, ever gets nervous or worrying about school? And if so, what are some of the things that you use to maybe help him out a little bit and deal with that? Yeah, I mean, even at that age, they have their little stresses, you know, and their little problems. And they are little issues, but to them, they're big problems, you know? And to me, I wish I only had those problems to deal with nowadays, you know? I'm like, well, then you pay the bills and I'll go back to school and deal with all the other kids. But, <laughs> um, right. My trick really is um, I just trick his little brain, you know, and at this this age, I can manipulate the brain to where he's overstressing with something and mom can't, you know, seem to figure out how to not get him to stress and he's upset and emotional. And I just trick his little brain like, hey, how about we play tag? Hey, you go and hide somewhere. Let's go across to the park and play on your little scooter. And when he hears something different, it's amazing how quickly you can go from one emotion to the other emotion of stress to, oh, wow, now my brain is being soothed and pleased by just tricking it into doing something else. Um, as like an adult and a parent, you know, I, for me, I like to go to the beach. I'm, I'm lucky enough, but it, you'd be amazed. Like go mow the lawn for an hour, you know, cook some, some a meal. Like it's, it's its own form of meditation, but you don't realize that your brain is actually being soothed by, by doing something and actually seeing an outcome a lot of the time can de-stress your brain to where you've seen accomplishments. And, um, you know, with me, that's why I, I kind of feel like at the end of the day, when my son's stressed, I've accomplished the fact that we were able to get over that hump, you know, and then I take him to, to go ride his little scooter and he can't figure out because now these things, they go left to right when you tilt them, why it won't stop going right, you know, and then you go take him to the playground. Those are so important because what you're teaching him is, you know, emotional regulation. You're teaching him, and I'm sure Dr. Dr. Lewis and Aaron would both agree, like what you're teaching him and Amy is that when you feel stressed, when this happens, here's a solution. Here's a way to get that out of your body. Uh, and, and, you know, I think without even realizing it, you're already having those conversations uh, and giving them those tools to avoid substance use in the future, to be able to handle stressors, to be able to handle some anxiety. Uh, and, you know, those things start, again, as early as five years old, teaching them how to deal with those emotions so that they don't look for negative things, especially once they get older and have a little more freedom and the ability to find those things. Um, I think that's really great. I mean, that's, a, that's I, I'm, I, I, have a feeling meditation, exercise, all of that is always a good idea when you're stressed. Yeah. Um, so I think exactly what Daniel was touching on with his five-year-old, it's important to recognize the emotion. And again, this can be as young as once kids start talking um, and helping them to identify what that emotion is. So they're feeling stressed, they're feeling worried. It's okay to feel that way, right? But what are we going to do with that? And so shifting to be able to do a fun activity, exercise, doing something to just kind of ch change the brain, uh, the way that it's operating, um, I think is important. And so if we're doing something fun, like an activity like that, we can talk about our feelings. So especially with four, five, six-year-olds, um, you can do some coloring and drawing. And there are all these activities that you can use to help them process what they're experiencing, right? But doing it in a fun way, because we know play is essential, especially for younger kids. Um, and so being able to shift in that moment is important, but it's important to recognize that what they're feeling is an actual, you know, you're validating what they're feeling and saying, okay, you know what, this is what we're going to do. Why don't we go play this game or why don't we, and you help them shift. And eventually they learn those skills to be able to regulate their own emotions as they get older. Saving lives means staying informed. Knowing the dangers of using counterfeit prescription pills can help those you care about and keep our community safe. As a parent, educator, neighbor, or friend, we all play a role in building safe and healthy futures for ourselves and our loved ones. Do your part. Take the first step today. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com to access education, prevention, and treatment resources. Counterfeit prescription pills laced with fentanyl are deadly. Be their protector. Be informed. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. 
You know, talking about stress in kids, oftentimes, uh, you know, it manifests a little differently than it does in an adult. Uh, and so we need to be able to look out for some of the things that kids are feeling and how they're expressing their stress, because it might not look how we think it's going to look. Uh, I, I would love to hear, Dr. Lewis, Aaron, you know, some of those things, ways that maybe we can recognize stress in our kids. Well, I think in terms of identifying um, stress and anxiety, children, it often does manifest a little bit differently. And so what we would look for um, is some emotional changes. So often our kids might be a little bit more moody or irritable. You might see more tears and meltdowns in situations where in the past it seemed to be perfectly fine. But now it seems like the frustration tolerance is a little bit lower. Um, often kids will complain of physical symptoms of stress in terms of stomach aches or headaches is just not feeling well. So we get a lot of avoidant behavior of, I don't, I'm too sick to go to school or I don't want to go to this party. And they're complaining about not feeling well. So there are some physical symptoms as well. I think with our teenagers, um, on top of their already um, fluctuating moods, they might be a lot more irritable, um, a lot more withdrawn and stay in their room. Staying away from friends is a huge sign as well, given that our teens are pretty social. And so when they stop doing the things that seem to be pretty normative, hanging out with friends, calling or connecting um, with their peers, that could be a sign um, as well. And so, you know, kids will start, they sometimes will even just verbalize what they're worried about or what they're stressed about. So you'll pick up on patterns in the language that they're using when they're talking about something that's going on at school, or they just seem to come home each day and have a lot to talk about, um, which could be a change from generally your, your child not telling you much of anything. And so that could be a sign that they're feeling more stressed um, and anxious. And also we talk about like sleep patterns and, you know, I know for even my own children, like seeing a change in their sleep patterns or those types of irregularities, not eating their school lunch, not, you know, having an appetite as we talked about. So a lot of those physical symptoms that, you know, kind of, it's like, are they sick? But really it's coming, you know, what's happening is it's a stress symptom. Yeah, I agree with all of those things uh, that Dr. Lewis and Aaron, you just mentioned. And, you know, on the other side of that, sometimes we might start seeing symptoms of separation anxiety kind of, you know, with this. So a child that might become overly kind of attached to their parent or worried to be away from their parent or a caregiver, you know, certainly comes into play. And something that we're talking about throughout kind of these episodes is also bullying. And, you know, so so when we talked about or when we will talk about, you know, the symptoms of kind of like bullying and, and how we might know that bullying might happen, it makes sense to me that a lot of the, the things might feel the same because kids develop anxiety around social interactions and around having to go back into social interactions where they're unsafe from bullying. So there, you know, that's where that kind of, I think, ties all together. Now, once we maybe see some of those signs and we recognize some of those things in our kids, what are, um, what are the things that we can, we can help with, that we can provide for them, some of the guidelines, the structure, the emotional support? You know, I know one thing that they always tell you to do, especially with kids, teenagers, is to not minimize their feelings. While it might feel like, I wish I had your problems, <laughs> you know, as a parent, um, what I always have to remember is I've suffered uh, through 40 years of experiences and pain and heartbreak and all of this, but for kids... So this is often the first time, this is the first experience that they've had with that feeling or with that emotion. And so for them, it's huge, it's new, it's all encompassing. So, you know, I also really try to, to have that in the forefront of my mind is to not minimize um, my kids' feelings, um, you know, when they're, when they're expressing something to me. But what are some of the other ways that parents and caregivers can help their kids if they do notice some signs of stress and anxiety? I think teens are great at picking up on authenticity. So Jody, as you mentioned, it's important that you show that you hear them and you validate their experience. And so if they're coming to you with a, a concern or they're telling you something that happened at school, it's easy as a parent to say, oh, you know, that's not a big deal. You'll forget about it tomorrow. And that can minimize their, their, their experience. Um, so I would say making sure that you're open um, letting your child approach you with anything and coming with a non-judgmental attitude and really talking through with them to try to problem solve. So you don't have to be the expert as a parent. You can admit when you don't know something. And if you are concerned that there are high levels of anxiety or depression or you're noticing changes in behaviors, just talking about it together and saying, you know, maybe we should look up some information and doing things together to say that I care about you and here's a plan, right? What's the plan that we're going to come up with? 
But I think um, it's just most important to validate those experiences that they're having, that they're in a safe place to talk about however they're feeling. Absolutely. I always used to have my kids draw it out too. Like if they were feeling something and they didn't couldn't quite put it into words, I'd say, you know what, go, go do some art. Go draw something, go, if it's a scribble, if it's a nice how, whatever it is, get that out and onto some paper, especially for little kids that maybe can't write out their feelings in a journal. I I always found that art was like a great way to get them to express whatever it was that was inside. And also, you know, Daniel talked about it too, getting them outside, get outside, get away from whatever that focus is and that stress. Cause I know for myself, if I'm inside caught up in the, you know, (laughs) in the spin cycle, Um, sometimes I just need to remove myself from that environment and go out and do something. Um, so there's so many ways that, you know, once you see some of these things in your kids that you can really step in and and help provide some of that safety net, uh, and those, you know, those, those emotional tools to help them learn how to do this themselves. I think that's so important too. And like, so go outside, cook with your kids, do, do an activity. And, you know, cause even taking away that, the eye contact and some of those things, walking alongside, having those conversations in your car are so powerful in just building that kind of uh, inclusion. I love what Dr. Lewis said about like, listen to hear, right? That's so critical. And then also regulate your own emotions because depending on your age of your own children that you're talking to and, you know, what what may be coming at you may be very emotional for you in your in your own uh, regulation. And so being able to not make that something that they just kind of shut down when they see that emotion. And that's hard. That's hard to do. Uh, having a 27 year old and a nine year old, I've learned over the years, right? Cause I really, I'm like, this is the second chance to get it right. <laughs> and so again, it's like, right. Figuring it out. Um, but, uh, in building resilience, you know, that's what we're really doing is we're walking kids through problem solving skills and communication skills and building resilience. And as we, um, Amy had talked about the bullying episodes, you know, in the future and really all of these interactions around helping kids um, de-stress are really tools that they're going to going to use in the future around bullying or peer pressure. I would also say that, you know, I, I think it's generally kind of accepted that young young people are going through unprecedented levels of stress you know between covid and you know everything else in our world there's just so much on them and so much is on us as adults too and i i think it's important for caregivers and parents to know that you know what to look for but also to know that they're not alone you know if they're concerned about these types of worries for their child you know that they don't have to hold that all by themselves some resources that come to my mind you know as kind of starting points for parents would be certainly a primary care physician and also you know your child's school and school counselors and things but I, i'm um, interested to know from dr lewis or aaron are there other resources that that come to your mind that are helpful for parents to kind of get connected to if they're worried about these things I think you're right on, um, Amy, with ha- directing parents towards either kind of school counselors to the pediatrician. I would say as far as online resources, a lot of what we do here at NIH with the research, um, I would direct parents to go to the National Institute of Mental Health website that has a lot of information on how to identify signs and symptoms in your children, in your teenagers. Um, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations, um, specifically anxiety and Depression Association of America has a lot of information for parents as well as children, for adults as well as kids. Um, and you know, I do think it's important that parents pay attention to their own well-being. So, Amy, as you mentioned, we're in unprecedented times, and so uncertainty essentially is a breeding ground for anxiety. And we have a lot of uncertainty going on, and so we want to encourage parents to take care of their own mental well-being, as they're often the first models for our kids and how to regulate and how to manage these these emotions. So I think it's important parents also seek services when necessary, as well as for their kids. Um, so right, so NIMH is a good website to go to. Sam says some of the government funded websites um, are great resources. Absolutely, I've they are great resources. I've used some of those myself. I've looked into them. There's some fabulous information on there, especially the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, there's great tools and stuff out there. So if you're a parent and you're looking, I promise you there are things out there. And, and like they said, definitely refer to your primary care physician, physician or your or your pediatrician. I know that has been a huge help for my girls. Like Dr. Lewis was saying that it's kind of like on an airplane, you know, when you hear the, the, the pilot say, please put your mask on before you put your infants or someone else's on you first. If you don't have your own stress under control or your own household uh, near most, 
that could cause stress down the line. And, and then it's like almost a ripple effect. Coming up on the next part of this episode. I think the greatest thing is today is the fact that we are actually understanding that kids have stress. Found that little moments of self-care throughout the day are actually the most sustaining for me. It's that self-care doesn't have to be something that takes a huge chunk out of your day. Our kids need that connection. They want to be connected to their parents and they want to be able to lean on us and making that a safe environment to do so is critical. We can do a brief, a little guided visualization right now. And it's gonna inhale and exhale. And as you picture yourself continuing to walk along the beach, you're imagining all of the stress just coming off of your shoulders, coming out of your body. Sometimes I come back into my body after just breathing for like, I mean, even just that brief moment for like a minute. And I'm like, oh. Make sure to check out GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Parents, caregivers, you can find so many resources of great information there about how to talk to your kids and make these conversations a little less awkward. A huge thank you to the Elks DAP, which is the largest all-volunteer nationwide drug awareness program, and also a huge thanks to the DEA for their outreach program and for making this possible. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Awkward Conversation series are solely those of the individuals, speakers, commentators, experts, and or hosts involved, and do not necessarily reflect nor represent those of the production, associates, or broadcaster, or any of its employees. Production is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the series available for viewing. The primary purpose of this series is to educate and inform. This series does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This series is available for private, non-commercial commercial use only. The production, broadcaster, or its channel cannot be held accountable for all or any views expressed during this program.